now started and we will get into the presentation. Um, if throughout the presentation you do have questions that come up, you are welcome to type them in the chat and I will get towards them at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session, just to kind of keep this moving along um, at hopefully an efficient pace. Thank you today, everyone, for joining us. This is a short presentation about uh, MHEX FAFSA completion initiative. Uh, we have a very simple agenda today of what is FCI, access to MDCAPs, which is how we utilize FCI, how to actually utilize FCI, and then Q&A at the end. We wanted to have this presentation to make sure people understood the usage of FCI, the benefits of it, and how to get started on it or refamiliarize themselves if they've used it in the past. With that, let's go into it. So the FAFSA Completion Initiative is for qualified participants and entities and organizations who are tied to college, college access and success, whether that is high schools, high school districts, local education agencies, nonprofits, or other qualifying partners. Um, it provides limited FAFSA data on individual students and identifies some limited aspects of that data to help understand where students are at in their financial aid journey and their FAFSA completion journey. So it'll tell you if a student has submitted a FAFSA and when, it'll tell you certain errors that are on the FAFSA that would need correction. It also tells you if students have been selected for federal verification, which means they would be needing to submit additional documentation to their institutions that they are interested in attending. And then new this year is if the student is eligible for the GA, EA, or Promise Scholarship based off of FAFSA information only. So there are other aspects of GA, EA, and the Promise Scholarship that are tied to eligibility, but based off the FAFSA data, this is the initial eligibility. Data is uploaded and then pulled from the Maryland uh, College Aid Processing System, also known as MDCAPS, and then for individuals to be able to participate in our FAFSA completion initiative, it means they need to have access to MDCAPS as that is where all the information is housed and the exchange of data happens. So let's go into access to MDCAPS. Some of you already have MDCAPS accounts. Some of you are in the process of getting MDCAPS accounts. And some of you are like, I don't, I don't know where to start. That is okay. So Every new individual who wishes to access FCI data has to go through the FCI request process. And that is multiple steps, but two procedures. There is one procedure tied to requesting to participate in the FAFSA completion initiative. And then once that is done, the second procedure, which is actually creating the MDCAPS accounts and the agreements to participate in using the MDCAPS system. So individuals who have previously participated in FCI, um, you may, depending on when we last had you complete the process, you may have to go through and submit documentation again. This is a result of our state auditing process that happened this year um, and making sure that we are in compliance with regulations tied to accessing systems that have sensitive personalized data on them. So the link here is where you would go to access information about FCI, access the forms that you'll need to fill out and be able to access uh, the Google form that you would fill out as a part of the FCI request to participate process. So step one, fill out the appropriate form based off of type of entity or organization. So for our nonprofit organizations that are participating in this meeting, that means the nonprofit certification form and participation agreement. You'll notice that the other types of organizations or entities have their own documentation. And so the LEA verification form is not the same as the nonprofit certification form. So it is very important that you are filling out the correct forms for the process and making sure that everywhere there's a signature needed, initials needed, information needed, dates needed, that those are accurately filled out. 
Once you've completed those forms, you're going to fill out the FAFSA Completion Initiative Participation Request Google form and submit those completed documents as a part of that. So you might have done this in the past. Let's say you might have done it three years ago. It is likely that you would have to do it again because of the result of the auditing process. Once those documents are reviewed, once you've submitted that Google form with those uploaded documents, they are reviewed for approval, not just by the Office of Student Financial Assistance, but also by our legal team here at IMHEC, as well as eventually going to the Secretary's Office of IMHEC. So it is a multi-step process that occurs once we receive your documents. And therefore it does take a few days for all of the approvals to work if everything is accurate and in order. So when you submit, we do ask for patience because it is not just the Office of Student Financial Assistance involved, it is multiple offices involved. And so we are working with multiple schedules and timelines. Once those forms have been reviewed and approved, that means you've now essentially had that approval to participate in the FAFSA completion initiative. You will then be emailed as an individual, so the individual requesting access is individually then sent the MDCAPS user agreement. And so this is the second procedure associated with this process. That means filling that out and making sure to check the correct boxes of what type of entity you are, making sure everything is accurately signed. Once we receive that, and that is reviewed and approved, the MDCAPS account can be created. You as an external user do not create the MDCAPS account. We create it for you on your behalf once we have all of the necessary paperwork and then you are sent an email that has the temporary login information so you can access your account, activate it, change the password to whatever you want, all of that. But you as an external user don't create the account. That is not the same situation as what is the case for students. Students go in and create their own accounts all the time. If you were to attempt to create your own account, you would be classified as a student because that is the only external account that exists that can have that type of uh, sign up. This is really important. Like I would, if this could be a flashing light, a sirens going off, blaring in the distance, <laughs> this is key. So once you have an active MDCAPS account, you must log in and change the password currently every 90 days or the account will become inactive. Once the account is inactive, you have to complete a new MDCAPS user agreement. And I believe in uh, uh, Ms. Coakley, who's on the call can correct me, it might be depending on the situation that you would have to completely start the process all over again. Um, we are in the process of potentially changing that from every 90 days to every 60 days, um, once again, to be in compliance with state auditing processes. What I would recommend is once you have that active MDCAPS account, set a little alarm, a little calendar uh, event for you that says every 89 days, you are going to go in and you're just going to change your password and then you're going to log right back out and that keeps you in active status. So it's kind of like a passport. You don't want the passport to become expired because then you have to do a whole bunch of paperwork versus if you just remember to renew it, there's less paperwork and less hassle involved. Similar thing, so every 90 days, the password must be changed or the account goes into an active status and we start a longer process again. So with that, we're going to move into actually using FCI. The good news is the FAFSA completion initiative as a process is very, very easy. There is really only two features to it. You as nonprofit organizations are uploading something and then you're downloading something. And that's it. There's, <laughs> uh, it's a two-step process really. So first step is then creating the content and the data that is going to be uploaded into MDCAPS. Um, so you're going to create 
and save a CSV file that includes the following columns. So you can see there are five columns there, first name, last name, date of birth, there's zip code, and high school name. High school name is optional, so it's those first four that are key. And the column headings, how they are written here, is exactly how they need to be written for the CSV file. Um, that way the system knows to recognize uh, the data as it's being uploaded and what type of data it is. So you list everything out, making sure to kind of follow the format. So like date of birth needs to be with slashes um, versus dashes. All of that for all the students that you're interested in gaining the information on of have they done their FAFSA for the current academic year. Once you've created your list, you log into your active MD CAPS account. Um, and you as an FCI uh, participant have a very limited view of what MD CAPS can do. So there's very limited things on your home dashboard. One of those is the FAFSA completion section where you can see there's just two options. You upload something, you download something. So you select upload high school student file Then you select choose file on the screen that will appear and upload the CSV file that you have created. Once you do that, you're gonna get a message in the system that the file has been uploaded. You can then, we'll have a little hyperlink written at the top right there that'll say click here and then you can download the information you just uploaded now with the information pulled from the system on how, when, if, and how a student has completed their FAFSA. So what information are you actually receiving once you download this exported information? So this is everything you get in addition to the original information you provided. So you're still gonna have the first name, the last name, the date of birth, the zip code, and the high school and then added columns along the end of the CSV file that will be exported from the system. So you're gonna get that submitted date, so when the ICER application was received, the process date, so when the ICER uh, transaction was processed, so the difference between when it was submitted and when a system ran through and processed it. Um, we have selected for verification, indicates if the student was selected for federal verification. FAFSA status, which indicates whether the student has a complete or incomplete FAFSA on file, which we'll get into that, and the incomplete reason. And then the MHEC ID number, so the student's MHEC ID number in MD CAPS, which will be incredibly useful for reference, particularly if you are working with a student, you can be like, remember your, MD, your MHEC number for MD CAPS. And then our new features starting this year, which is the EA status, the GA status, and the promise status for our three auto consideration awards. So important to note that this only works if the student's information is getting imported into MD CAPS, which does mean they need to have at least one Maryland institution on their FAFSA to be available. So for the students who are like, I'm getting, I'm leaving Maryland and they list no Maryland institutions on their FAFSA, we are not gonna be able to pull that information into MD CAPS and then it would not be available within the FCI download. Okay, so when you are uploading information, um, what MD CAPS is doing is looking at those four data points provided and doing a match um, between the student's name, their date of birth, and ideally their zip code. Our system is able to tell you whether um, everything matched, all four of those data points were in alignment, or if there was only a partial match, or if there were multiple matches, or alternatively, if no data received, nothing pulled, which could be the case of, you know, if someone doesn't have any Maryland uh, institutions listed, you would get no match. If they haven't done the FAFSA at all, you would get no match. Um, so there is some variety there that occurs that means 
the full match, you can be fairly sure that the individual you have uploaded information for is the information is the person you're receiving information for in return. So the incomplete column has a few different uh, codes that are going to be listed in it. Um, these are pulled from uh, the Department of Education from FAFSA, alerting that there is some error that is happening within the student's FAFSA submission that would need to be corrected with FAFSA, not with MHEC. So here are the fields. There's only a handful. So a missing signature would mean that now it's a, a student's contributor or the student themselves. Is, we have a signature missing on the FAFSA. Um, they, if it shows citizenship, it means that in some way, shape, or form, the information needed to determine a student's residence eligibility was not included on the FAFSA and needs to be corrected. Then we have a student's social security number is not valid or incorrect, it was input wrong. Now with it being FTI that is being used within the FAFSA, these are going to be probably less common unless it's manually entered data um, in which, you know, the student or the contributors were non-tax filers, any number of scenarios in which it might be manual data um, input versus FTI, uh, which is federal tax information pulled directly from the IRS. And then a kind of catch all other reasons, in which case the student should follow up um, with the federal student aid to figure out what is the issue that's occurring with their FAFSA. And then verification, basically it's you get uh, a Y or an N for a yes or a no if they've been selected for verification by the Department of Ed. And then our new uh, columns, our new bits of information that we're providing starting this year, it identifies if a student is EA, GA, or Promise Scholarship eligible. And so there's three data points that could be there, three data entries. They could either be marked as eligible, they could be marked as ineligible, or if it's blank, it means they weren't considered at all for the award. And the likely scenarios for that to happen is, for example, the student only listed four-year institutions on their FAFSA. So our system is like, well, they didn't list any community colleges. We aren't going to consider them for the Promise Scholarship. Or uh, in the event with the GA, because the GA has such specific income requirements, if a student, you know, if their family's total income is, you know, $10,000 over the amount, um, the threshold, then they are just not going to be considered for the GA. Um, most students would get a marking on the EA, as most students who are not eligible for the GA are can looked at for the EA. So it doesn't mean they're eligible, but they would be looked at for it. Um, and of course, if students, you know, submit new FAFSAs that provide new information, that then could change a student's eligibility, a new um, downloaded FCI report would reflect that. So let's say student first submits their FAFSA, there is no community colleges listed on it. They go back in, they add community colleges to their FAFSA, we get that new transaction. You run this report again, and the student would theoretically, you know, be able to have pulled their, are they eligible or ineligible for the Promise Scholarship now that they can be considered for it. Okay, that was, like I said, I wanted to make sure this is a very fast, quick, and to the point um, presentation on that. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to answer the question that was placed into the chat first, which was from Deja. Will there be a reminder sent to change the password if we try to log in? No, there is not going to be any um, notifications sent out. It is just going to be individuals, users need to be mindful that they are changing their passwords as far as I know. Okay. Jack and Jackie, if I'm wrong, correct me. Okay, we do send out notices. They start coming out, I believe it's two to three weeks before the password needs to be changed. 
I love being proven wrong. So Deja, yes, you will get a notification. Um, it would come through the system. So it'd be yes. through our system notification system and it wouldn't be coming from, for example, my email or anything like that. It'd be a system notification, which has its distinct email address. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, we have Andra. Okay, do we have to upload a certain list to be able to download the FAST completion list? Um, or is this based on the pre-qualified senior list we uploaded in March? So while you do have to upload a certain format to the list to make sure that our system can do that matching, it does not need to be students um, who are participating in your NGS program or are pre-qualified seniors. If they do not pre-qualify, if they aren't, uh, participating uh, NGS students, but they are students you work with, you are able to input those four data points, uh, first name, last name, date of birth, and zip code, and upload it and get this information. It just needs to be students that you are working with through your college access work. Any other questions, whether spoken or written, either way, totally fine with me. And I will say, in addition to this presentation being recorded, and it, I'll make sure that it is available through the MHEC YouTube channel, you will also get a copy of the presentation itself. I will send this out after we finish here today so that you have access to everything and can click through to the links um, as you see fit. And yes, so I can provide the CSV template for um, the FCI upload. We also have an FCI user manual, um, which at the moment does not include the information about our new uh, EAGA Promise Scholarship and those uh, information columns, but does kind of take you through everything you need to know otherwise. Um, and that will be sent out along with the presentation slides after the end of this presentation. Um, Ayana, will student accounts also, so students are exempt from the 90 day password renewals. That is been confirmed um, and it has existed since the start of the MDCAP system that students are exempt from that. So they do not have to worry about it. It is only external users. So that is nonprofits, local education agencies, uh, high schools, high school districts are, um, our legislators as well and their offices who are accessing the system for their particular scholarship program. So anyone who kind of falls into that external user category. Uh, any other questions? And it is okay if not. Um, Al and Jackie, since you are on the call, is there anything you would like to add? Anything that I forgot or you can explain in more detail that you think would be beneficial? Um, otherwise, um, you go for it, Jackie. Just, okay, thanks, Catherine, for the presentation. Um, I do want to let everyone know that we are in the process of changing who can sign the agreement so it can be a faster process. So um, once I get the approval, we will have new agreements so that someone in MAC can sign it and it won't have to go up to legal and the secretary can take like a week or so. Great presentation, Catherine. Um, I will just add, um, due to the changes with the FAFSA um, and bringing in federal tax information, which we call FTI for short, um, there will be agreements that will also be sending out to each nonprofit. It is a um, security type agreement uh, based off um, being able to share the FAFSA data, um, unfortunately not FTI data, but FAFSA data. Um, the federal government has required that um, we uh, have new agreements um, for the third party organizations um, that assist students with completing the FAST. Um, so we're waiting for our legal department to um, approve those, and then we will be sending them out um, to you. Um, so just a note on that, uh, that those will be coming out, and um, definitely um, each different nonprofit organization 
will need to sign one agreement per each nonprofit organization covering the individuals that fall under that nonprofit organization. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. Other than that, um, we're here to help. Let's uh, get as many students to complete the FAFSA as possible. Uh, we are working on awarding students. Uh, awarding is going place on a weekly basis, unfortunately not on a daily basis due to the system needing to recalculate and update students' awards, but we are awarding on a daily basis. Um, so you will see that information. Also, uh, it was brought to our attention that uh, with the FAFSA completion initiative in the report, um, there are a few issues or errors on the report. So we are looking into that. Uh, please still use the report because it does provide good information. Uh, the different issues, errors, we are updating uh, and it will not um, affect you pulling the report. We'll just update that information and provide you um, an update when that information has been updated on those reports. Hey, Al. I have a question. It's yes. Deep. Um, so I guess in regards to, I know I uh, emailed you one on one in regards to students that are check currently checking. They've their FAFSAs have been received by you guys. And so they're checking their accounts. Um, but currently, I know for most of our students, everything is saying ineligible. And so I was not sure exactly would like is are they to wait for like an update or is that because some of that information basically like if they have a community college on there, but it still says an eligible for promise or uh ea and ga for some of our students so i wasn't sure if uh the students are to, to still wait um just because i know may 15th uh is the priority deadline right so the priority deadline and we are going to work on updating our website so everybody understands the priority deadline the priority deadline is based off a student completing their fast so the priority deadline is not based on anything else, awarding or anything else. It's just more okay. so a student completing their FAFSA. As long as a student completes their FAFSA by mm -hmm. the priority deadline, if they are identified as eligible, uh, that mm -hmm. student will be uh, awarded. Uh, in regards to the um, eligibility, we know that there are about a hundred different records in which the system is reading the negative 1500 and mm -hmm. not calculating correctly. So those okay. individuals, we are working on those 100 individuals um, in which the system is not reading that correctly. Okay. Um, in other cases, individuals are asking that it may say eligible, but it has a zero. If it has a zero, that means that we have not ran awarding on that particular student at this time. Okay. So that's why it says eligible, but reads a zero. Uh, so again, as we come along these different things, we are working on fastly uh, quicking it, um, fixing them. Um, mm -hmm. But there are cases where students may be ineligible because the Pell Grant is, I believe, 7,000 some odd dollars. Yeah, uh, 95 dollars. Right, so if a student is attending a, a community college mm -hmm. uh, and the cost of attendance is less than the Pell Grant or shows that the student has no need, it mm -hmm. would determine that the student is ineligible, um, not that they don't meet the criteria, but the fact that they have no need means that that student would not be eligible. Okay. Yeah, just, I think, yeah, my my uh, concern, because we had the st some students that uh, we did income verification, and so I know they have a negative 1500, they received the email that their FAFSA was received, but the mm -hmm. EA and GA say ineligible. And so I was going to have them call next week, um, but I just didn't know what was best as far as the timeline to find out. Um, so those students that um, it says that they're ineligible, they can give a call because we want to make sure that there's no issue with their records as well. Okay. Uh, but again, you definitely want to look at the student's cost of attendance. Uh, to see if that Pell is more than the student's cost of attendance, because in that case, uh, for instance, if the student has that they're only going to a community college, they right. have the negative 1500, which is equivalent to us as a zero uh, SAI. Um, but that 7,000 covers their cost 
uh, that student would be ineligible, not because they don't meet the income criteria, but because mm -hmm. that individual has no need. So if right. that individual had a different school on there that had a higher cost of attendance, in that case, then the student would become eligible because they show a need compared to the community college. Yeah, these are four-year students. Okay, okay. I'll have them, so, I'll have them call next week. Yes, please do. Please have them call in so we can um, see what's going on with their account. And I okay. did see that someone uh, identified a question of saying uh, the student sees zero but eligible. Again, if a student uh, is eligible but they see a zero, that means that we have not awarded them yet. We have over 5,000 students to award. Unfortunately, the system just doesn't do one big bulk award easily like that. There's a lot of recalculations that happen on a regular basis. So we are awarding batches of students as fast as possible. Um, and again, we're awarding on a weekly basis. Uh, so just because of zero students in zero today, uh, we could run awarding on Monday and that student then would be awarded and see an award on their account. Yeah, and so I do want to make sure people understand we do, as Al said, have some current known issues where students who based off of their income would be marked eligible for GA or EA. Um, currently a known issue within the system, mostly caused by that negative 1500 SAI, um, that the system is not running the correct calculation. That is something actively being worked on. Um, students should still call in case there is something else. They can also email if they want. Um, either way is acceptable to us um, just to look into potentially another issue or something wrong, but that is a known issue currently. Um, right now, in response to Ayana's question of what day of the week will weekly awarding happen, uh, Al, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we necessarily have a, at this point right now, as we are currently working with our system, a set, it happens to this day every day um, or every week, um, but it is happening at least weekly um, at the moment. We're hoping as we work through some of these known issues that we get to a more steady cadence. Um, and Andrea, I wanted to make sure to answer the second part of your question about if the student sees zero but eligible. Um, in the FCI uh, downloaded report, there is no information about the amount of the award a student will receive. The only information provided about the EA, GA, and Promise awards are if they are eligible, ineligible, or not considered at all based off of information from the FAFSA. So there is no additional information at all about any of the awards within the FCI. Um, Ayana, uh, so it's mostly, I think, due to the negative FT, F, negative 1500 SAI um, that our system is having issues since prior to this year. <laughs> we stopped at zero. <laughs> um, so the system is still kind of working on figuring out um, those calculations. Our vendors are working on it. Like I said, known issue. Um, they've been working very hard on making getting it fixed as fast as possible because we know students want to know about their awards. And as a reminder, when students are awarded, they do get those email notifications telling them of their awards. So they are welcome to check the system daily but they also will get an email notification. So make sure they are checking their emails as well. And it'll be the emails that is on their accounts, which predominantly is the emails they used on their FAFSA. Um, so make sure they're checking those emails, checking spam, making sure that our emails are approved emails for them so that they come through. And, and let me just um, add Catherine that, um... If you do or have a student that goes to log on to MD Caps and they get a error message, uh, then definitely please let us know as soon as possible. Anytime we take down the system, there will be a notification before you even log in or can log into MD Caps indicating that the system is down for maintenance. So when an individual logs into MD Caps and sees the system's down, 
that's usually a server problem um, based off the current system and how it's set up, uh, the amount of individuals on the system and processes running uh, within the system sometimes slows it down and causes it to go off the server in those cases until we know uh, we can't do anything about that. So if you do experience any of these issues, please reach out to us as soon as possible so that we can check with um, our uh, maintenance team uh, to make sure everything is working correctly. And, and which is why we unfortunately can't award every day on a daily basis. Uh, there's no, we try to award as much as possible. That's why I said it's no one day or, or certain days. If we can award three days in the week, we will run awarding for those three days in the week. Uh, if the system is recalculating and it's too many records that it's recalculating, we have to wait till the system recalculates. Um, but again, our, our emphasis is to award as fast as possible, as many students as possible, and make sure that we are providing students with the correct award amounts. Any other questions? I know I set this time to end at 2.45, so we have about four minutes left. Um, any other questions, whether um, if you take yourself off mic or if you want to write it into the chat, both are acceptable. Unfortunately, um, the award dollars are part of FERPA. Uh, we would have to see if we could develop a process where every student uh, that is part of it does a FERPA form with you. And the system would be able to read that you, as the nonprofit, uh, are on their FERPA form. It gets very complicated with FERPA because um, it would have to go to one individual that would be on the FERPA form. And if you had an individual that left, then every student would have to notify or put that new student. So the best thing that we could do is provide that general information uh, that does not fall into FERPA requirements of letting you know if a student actually um, does show that they complete the FAFSA, as well as if the student does show that they are eligible for the GA uh, or EA award. Uh, from there, you know, we look at the relationship that you have with those students, and hopefully you can connect with those students and be able to uh, work with them and, and they could show you their award or share their award letter with you as the nonprofit agency. Um, servicing them and supporting them. Uh, again, also let me uh, indicate EA initial students um, are not being awarded at this time. Uh, law requires that we award GA students that are defined as the most uh, needy students. Um, so we have to award all GA students renewals and initials prior to awarding any EA initials. So we will not uh, focus on uh, seeing if we can award EA initial students until end of June. Hopefully by end of June, we will have made sure that all GA students have been awarded. Uh, question was, how does the 5,000 GA compare? Um, can you jump on the mic and, and Please kind of clarify what your question is actually asking. Hi, good afternoon. I heard you say that currently you all have to award 5,000 students who are eligible for the GA. Is that correct? Is that what you said? No, I didn't say 5,000 students. Oh. I, said we, I said as law requires, we have to award all GA students prior to EA students because GA are the priority within the law. Oh, uh, no, I meant earlier in the in the session. I meant earlier in the training. Catherine, did you indicate 5,000? No, I think you might have said it, Al, um, when you were talking about the awarding process and how it's currently occurring. That might have been just you naming a number off the top of your head. Um, in terms, I can't speak uh, to GA students year over year, um, but we obviously have seen as the nationwide, we've seen that significant decrease in terms of people who are submitting the FAFSA. Um, 
so that is one of the reasons why we're talking about the FCI, um, because we do need to encourage people to complete their FAFSAs. Um, in Maryland, I believe we're down, is it something like 20% Al, based off of recent data in terms of year over year numbers for FAFSA completion? Yeah, um, we're about we're about thirty four percent now. I think where the where the five thousand came in is so far we've been working on awarding over five thousand students, and I indicated that we can't award five thousand students, unfortunately, at one time. So it's not really a comparison. It's just the limitations of the system. Whereas before, uh, before we had all the complications with the new FAFSA, we would shut down the system. We would do one big award on students. It might be 3,000 students. And then we would shut down the system one more time and do another big award. Because of the pushback with the FAFSA, we're trying to award students as much as possible. And we're still trying to allow students to complete the FAFSA as well as the MHEC-1 app. So we're limiting how much we're shutting down the system. Because we're limiting how much we're shutting down the system, we are awarding in smaller spurts so the system can handle that batch of awards. So that's why I push that we are trying to award as much as possible um, any day possibly that the system allows us to award. We are moving forward. We're running that awarding process. And I got a question. This is Joe Fisher. How are you doing? All right. How are you, Joe? How are you doing, Catherine? Um, I, uh, my question is, you got students, we have some, st we, we got some students that are um, going to need in independent override appeals, especially for independent, you know, who are not legal guardian. Um, in some of the colleges, it takes them a while to do that. Um, we're hopeful that those funding will be available for those students who have to do that because some of the colleges are slower than others. Can you comment on that? I mean, unfortunately, the colleges do need to do that in order for the student to be determined eligible. For right. It. So, uh, again, you know, we have to award the majority of individuals and we can't hold off on awarding individuals. The big push is really for that student to have that information ready to keep talking to the colleges uh, so that the college can move forward on it. Usually colleges if the student has all their documentation prepared and all the documentation is correct, the college will move forward on it fast because they see it's very simple for them and they can move forward. A lot of times when the uh, documentation is not there, or seems like a complicated uh, situation. I, I do see where colleges may take a longer point of time. Um, but unfortunately, we, we've got to keep moving forward with awarding the eligible students that we have uh, for GM. All right, well, we'll just uh, have to reinforce to the Alliance to continue to advocate for their kids to make sure the schools move fast on that <clears throat> because mm -hmm. some are slower than others and it's no fault of the students. So anyway, we'll try to do that and uh, to help to get that done, okay? Okay. All right. Um, and also, I should say, Joe, just so you know, it is pretty much required by uh, the Department of Education that each institution should have fully published what the documentation is needed for a dependency override, like very specifically. So if institutions, as students are looking to do a dependency override appeal, if that information isn't readily available to them uh, by the university, that is an issue that should be raised as well because it should be publicly accessible information as required by Department of Ed uh, regulations. Um, just something I've been looking into as uh, I've been doing some exploration. Yeah, well, Mr. Fisher, I was going to say it's usually a, the, the documents, uh, well, the form, I should say the form is on the website. The problem, I think, is depending on the situation, how much documentation that student has to turn in and also if they're doing summer transitional programs because i know that we have some students doing summer transitional programs that are needing to go through uh, a, a dependency override appeal and so i, I just don't know how that's going to look for them uh due to needing to complete the program first so right and, and i mean uh, the the biggest thing i could say you know as as <laughs> someone who was once a financial aid counselor mm. what i told individuals was start as early as possible um 
you know, yeah. you, did you notice through the situation in September, you know, for the seniors, for the seniors that will be next year's seniors, uh -huh. um, you know, the situation in September, get the form, get letters from the teachers, then, um, you know, it just gives you more time and then make copies of that and save your own folder mm -hmm. so that you're not giving anybody your originals, but you have everything there. The student has written that letter already okay. so that it's just here. This is what I have. You know, I mean, as a counselor, I told people that and I used to get people that would come to my office with a packet and say, we listen to you, Dorset, here you go. And I was able to go to that packet and say, this is here, this is here, this is here great you go and and I'd be able to do it in 20 minutes okay. so you know the more that you have that information ready prepared it's easier for them to move forward with it too got it okay thank you sorry Mr. Fisher go ahead no that's okay I don't and I know you all want to wrap up but Al and Catherine I just want to let you know the issue I'm bringing up for me right now I know there's appeals on your level but I'm talking about appeals on the collegiate level um, their infrastructure, some of them, and Deja will tell you, some of them are very, very slow. And it, it, it's sad, we got stuff we're working on right now, especially when it comes to renewal because of that. So I just wanna bring that to your attention. Um, it's no fault of yours, but that's something that, you know, we'll keep advocating for and, and get improved, but I just want you to make you aware of that, okay? Yep. All right. Um, since we are a little bit over time, um, unless there's any, you know, final questions, I will say we can wrap. Um, thank you again so much for your time, everyone today. Um, if you do think of any further questions related to FCI, related to the NGS process, um, which Ayana, we will work on developing a training um, tied to proof of income for NGS pre-qualification students. Um, please send an email um, and I will work on making sure I can get you a response. And if I don't know it, finding the person who can give me the answer. Um, but otherwise, thank you all so much for your time today. All right, thank you.